All right, everyone, uh, welcome to uh, CSF 102, uh, Cybersecurity Fundamentals. Um, tonight's lecture, uh, we're really gonna cover um, this week's lesson um, that you guys are gonna be doing, which is essentially going to um, introduce you um, to networking um, overall. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to just uh, put them in the chat. Uh, Professor Jay and I are gonna be checking the chat box regularly. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or simply uh, uh, turn on your headset and ask us um, the question um, directly, okay? So essentially, uh, the agenda that I want to kind of cover tonight is going to really focus on the following. We're going to talk about networking, uh, part one. So I'm going to do a lesson overview of uh, this week's lesson. Uh, we're going to then dive into this week's lesson a little bit. I'm going to do a quick overview uh, of that lesson and really kind of give you the key things that I think you need to focus on in order uh, to complete this week's lesson. So the networking piece is a two-part lesson. And what I did was break it, I mean, break it down into, uh, I mean, it's usually a one-part lesson. I broke it down to two parts to kind of get you uh, accustomed to it. And then I'm gonna go back uh, to your very first assignment, which was virtual machines. So I'm gonna review that assignment with you. And then I'm gonna also go over the introduction to Python and Linux operating system uh, assignment, which I will also review. And uh, lastly, I'm gonna, uh, do a Q&A where you can ask any questions you have if we haven't answered it um, throughout uh, the lecture, okay? So networking part one. So uh, this is basically the lesson um, that you guys have uh, for this week. So if you log into um, Sakai, okay, you should see the following. So let me pause the share and do a new share. Let me see what's this stuff. Is this share? Give me one second. I'm just making sure I'm sharing the right screen. Share screen. Yep, there we go. Share screen. Okay. So this week, you're going to do uh, introduce to networking. So if you look, your quiz is gonna be available March 23rd. Similar to what we've basically been doing, March 23rd is gonna be this Friday. And your assignment's going to be due Monday, which is uh, March uh, 26th. I did not release this assignment on Friday because you guys were on spring break. And I just wanna reiterate that during the spring break time, uh, there were no lessons that were assigned um, or given to you so that you, know, you guys can kind of enjoy your spring break, so to speak, okay? So this week, um, the learning objectives are to distinguish types of networks and network topologies. Uh, we want you to really understand what the OSI network model is, so we're gonna be introducing you to that. We want you to relate the OSI model to hardware components in your computer. Um, I also want you to be able to describe networking devices and what they do and what they're often used for. I want you to definitely know the OSI physical layer, which is you know one of the seven layers uh, that exist. Um, in the OSI model. So the quiz is going to heavily focus on the OSI model in general. And one of the ways or one of the skill sets that I use often, I think, to remember the OSI model is please do not throw sausage pizza away ever. Uh, physical layer, network layer, data link layer, et cetera. As you go through the reading, um, it will go through, um, through it. And I'll also talk about um, the layers as well. If you ever decide you want to get CCNA certified or CCENC, et cetera, um, that exam heavily focuses on um, the OSI model, um, which is really not used anymore. Um, they use it as the, I guess it's the foundational element that really exists with it. The network um, layer or the network model is what they uh, more often use right now, the TCP IP uh, model. But it's, a what, rule, it's a rule of thumb generally. It's what, yeah. it's what we use as a baseline to problem solve. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's kind of, it's like, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, first, first layer is physical. So the first thing you would say to yourself is, is your ethernet cable connected? If it's not, then double check. Is it, is it broken? Then check it and then you work from there. Yeah, so if I come in here and I go to OSI model, try to see if this one does a good job. Yeah, so if you look in here, You'll see, all right, so I said please, right, which is your physical layer. Do not, which is your data link layer. Um, I guess it's never, which is your network layer. Throw, which is the transport layer. Sausage, 
which is your session layer, presentation, uh, which is pizza, away, which is the application, right? So you're probably asking, saying to yourself, why do I need to know this and why should I care? And I think Professor Jay made a, a very good point, right? When you look at the physical layer, it's where all of the physical components uh, exist, right? Because we're really introducing you to a lot of the networks, um, the hardware components, your switches, your routers, your desktops, your Cat5s, your Cat6, your Cat5Es, your RJ11s, et cetera. All of those exist um, at the physical um, layer. And then you have your data link layer. This is, I would say, the parts you can't really see, but they exist. Think about when you work in a post office, right? The mail goes from point A to point B. So mail can essentially be your frames, right? So what allows or determines how mail can travel from point A to point B, right? First you have a letter, then it has an address, then it has a stamp. How does the letter know where it needs to get to? The letter knows where it needs to get to because it has um, the address on it, right? The addresses were usually related to some kind of state, city, zip, code, number, etc. So those are your frames. Um, your packets is essentially, you know, the mail that's traveling. Um, the TCP is the protocol um, that's used. The, the transport layer is what transfers information from one end to the other. So think about if you and I were not able to speak the same language right now, we couldn't really establish a flow of communication. So the transport layer is what allows communication to happen from one device to another because uh, they speak um, the same language. Um, the session layer is what establishes the connection that allows for us to be able to talk back and forth, right? So I'm able to talk to you right now because I have what's known as a uh, network connection or some kind of internet connection that can allow me to speak to you. If that session was to break, I would not be able to speak to you uh, right now. The presentation layer is essentially what you see on your screen, right? You see me in the camera, you see the PowerPoint that I'm presenting. So you could see uh, what's in front of you. So that's what happens um, on your screen. And then the application is what exists on the user end. So think about um, what are we using to have this virtual meeting or have this conversation? First, we have Chrome, which is your web browser. Um, then we have Zoom, which is the application that we use to have uh, these virtual meetings. And that's kind of a huge overview of what this is. And if you decide you want to get your master's or your PhD, um, most professionals focus on one layer. Um, that's basically what you become an expert in. Uh, I have yet, I don't really know anyone who's an expert on all layers um, personally. Um, I do know people who know all the layers very, very well, but usually you specialize in one particular layer and that's what um, you focus on so to speak. So that's the huge overview of the OSI model um, that's used. Then you have the network model, which the reading gets into all of that um, as well. All right. Does that make sense to everyone, what I just said so far for the most part? Did you want to add anything else, Jay? No, you summed it up very well. Um, just <clears throat> in case you guys forget to, uh, he said, you know, please don't uh, Please do not throw please, sausage yes, pizza please, away. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. If you guys ever forget that, um, always think of it this way. You, you're always thinking about the physical connection, right? So you're sitting at your computer. The first thing you do is turn it on, right? So always think that's physical. That's what you're physically doing. The last thing you want to do after you turn it on is view something, right? You want to view your web browser. You want to open up Word. So always think of that as your application. And then try to work in between those lines to figure out two, three, four, five, and six if you ever forget that. Yeah. But always remember physical is the most important part because if it's not plugged in this, the OSI model just doesn't reference networking. I mean, obviously here it shows it, but it's in all walks of life as re in regarding to like computer technologies, you can use this in every, in every kind of aspect yeah. if you understand how to use it correctly. It's very, it's very important, especially in troubleshooting with help desk and everything. It's very important. Exactly. All right, so then we're gonna learn how to compare and contrast different types of internet connection types, which I'm gonna spend some of tonight doing. Then we're gonna, you have to learn how to describe the IP protocol, its properties and how it works. Then we want you to be able to explain the basics of uh, IP um, routing. So really um, the course material that I presented you with uh, goes over all of that. So I updated it so you guys can see the skill pipe reading. So this week we're asking you to read module four slash unit four which introduces you to network architectures, okay? Then you have unit five, which talks about the ethernet networks. Then you have the wireless networks, then the internet connections. 
um, et cetera. And what I can say to you is these next few weeks, the quizzes are, gonna little get, are going to get a little bit more robust. So you definitely wanna take a lot of notes um, on uh, this section. I think every, I think there's 20 to 30 questions uh, in this week's quiz uh, related uh, to this particular section because it really is a deep um, section, all right? So if I go back uh, here, I, let me see what I have. Networking part one, assignment overview, okay? So let's open up the assignment and let's see kind of what you're being asked to do here in this week's assignment, okay? So this week, we ask you to, and this assignment covers some of the basic network concepts and tools. This assignment should be completed from inside your Windows XP Pro VM and your Linux VM in a document called last name underscore networks or last name. So basically that's how you're gonna save it, all right? So the Windows network perimeters host name, open the command prompt within the VM and run the command IP config slash all, which is the host name of this VM. Okay, so I'm sorry, what is the host name? Uh, of this VM. So basically this is one of the questions you have to answer um, uh, right here. Okay, so what is the host name of this VM? So let's switch over to our Windows XP so you guys can see exactly how uh, we want you to um, quote unquote uh, perform this and um, get this piece uh, done for us, all right? So what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna share this desktop, okay? And I'm gonna open up my Windows XP, okay? And right here, let me minimize this, okay? You are going to see uh, my Windows XP. Okay, so here it is, Windows XP. All right. So once you download it and set up the Windows XP properly, you should see exactly uh, what I have over here. Can everyone see my Windows XP, by the way? Does it, is it clean? Yeah, yeah, it looks good. All right, perfect. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm using my laptop, so I don't have a portable mouse to just click. You're not rocking that 1080 Ti, huh? Yeah, I'm using that on my desktop, but then I have two laptops, my Mac and my Windows. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then I'm trying to like, all right, how do I zoom in from this dang thing? Properties, desktop. Ah, you gotta figure it out after size. Control shift plus. All right, it doesn't wanna zoom in, but it's fine. All right, so in order to get to um, your command line from the Windows XP, okay, um, what you would have to essentially do is you're gonna go to start, you're gonna click on run, uh, at the bottom, okay? And then you're gonna get this little run command prompt that's going to pop here. So before I get into um, the command line, uh, when you set up and uh, downloaded your Windows XP, you wanna make sure that you have the following tools um, available because some of you were emailing me about taking the next courses, CSF 432 um, and CSF 569, I think. Um, those courses really, really are uh, fun and very robust. And what we try to do in CSF 102 is introduce you to the basics of all of the tools that you're gonna be utilizing in um, the higher level courses. So when you set up your Windows XP, you wanna make sure you turn on your WinHex to make sure that the WinHex works properly. You wanna make sure you turn on your NMAP to test and see if the NMAP works properly. You wanna make sure that your forensics uh, toolkit um, works properly. You wanna make sure that the password, password kit um, runs, the access data FTK imager works. You wanna turn on your Wireshark and make sure that that works properly, your registry viewer, the Nessus server configuration and Nessus client, because you wanna make sure that you test all of these applications and tools and see that they run and function properly because uh, you're gonna be utilizing them in CSF 102. When you take that, Next level courses, you're gonna also be utilizing and using um, a lot of those tools, okay? So let me go back. So to log into my terminal, um, there's a few things I could do in my uh, Windows machine. So I'm just gonna go to start, I'm gonna click on run, and it's gonna bring up this little dialog box here. From here, I'm gonna write CMD, which stands for command line, and you're gonna see my command line that's going to appear um, right here for um, all of us to see, okay? so 
right now that is known as my command prompt. So my command prompt is essentially the command line for my Windows operating system that allows me to do a lot of cool and uh, fun things, okay? So what the assignment asked me to do was to type in IP, okay, config, slash all, okay? And the question it's saying is, what is the host name of this VM? So how do I know what the host name of this VM is? If I look on the host name, okay, the first thing that I would see is forensics09, right? It says it right here, host name, and then I get to see forensics09. Um, so there's a few shortcuts and other ways that you can actually get the host name, um, but we had you write it like this, so that way you can kind of get used to running commands in the Windows XP. So if you were to actually just literally write host name, okay, you would also get um, the host name for uh, that particular machine. So what are some reasons that you guys can think of that you would want to know the host name? Why would I care about the host name of a particular machine? Or anyone, can anyone think, why would I need or want to know the host name of a particular machine? You can type it in uh, the group chat or you can just take a wild guess. Why would I want to know the host name of a machine? No one knows. No one can take a guess. All right. So I'll just uh, give it to you, okay? Um, so let's say uh, you're working in a big company or you're working in some kind of company of some sort and let's say there's a 1,000 employees, okay? If all computers were just named computer and all host names were just host name, host name, host name, or the name of the company, you'll run into a lot of issues, right? That is why usually when you put a machine on a domain of some sort, which uh, we'll get into, or you put them in some kind of a professional or enterprise environment, you wanna make sure you configure them with what's known as a, a proper uh, host name, right? So if you have a bunch of computers that's in a library, usually you would reference that room or that library so you can specify which computer belongs to what. So if there's 20 machines, Maybe you'll have library computer one, computer two, computer three, et cetera. So you can know which machine belongs to what. If you're assigning computers to someone, maybe, okay, the name of that computer would be uh, their first name, first letter of their first name, last name. Uh, that would be the host name that that machine belongs to. So the host name is a good way um, to find um, that particular machine so you can know exactly uh, where it is, who it belongs to, and where it's supposed to be. It makes it easier to locate and uh, find that machine if anything was to happen to it, okay? Um, so the second question in that assignment, so I'm looking directly at the assignment, but I'm gonna stick here on this Windows XP. It says, Windows Network Perimeters IP address looking through the output, IP config. You ran in the previous question. Take a screenshot showing your IP address. Circle your IP address using a simple image editor on your host machine. Include this image in your answer document. In a sentence or two, what is the IP address? Let me give you an example, okay? So right here is my IP address on my physical machine, right? If I look where it says IP address, I see 10.0.2.15. So that is the IP address for my machine. The second thing it's asking you guys to do is to take a screenshot showing your IP address. Circle your IP address using a simple image editor on your host machine. So how do I take a screenshot? Let's see here, uh, wrong thing. Does anyone remember how to take a screenshot on this? So how do I take a screenshot in my Windows machine or on my computer, okay, in my virtual machine? There's a lot of ways to do it, actually, all right? Snipping tool. <laughs> Ah, oh, man, that's too funny. Jay, does the sniffing tool exist in Windows XP? So believe it or not, um, the snipping tool uh, does not exist in your Windows XP. So 
have you guys been spoiled with these new machines to do that? Yes, you have. So what we can actually do, but there is no snipping tool in your Windows machine. What is the alternate way to take a screenshot without the snipping tool? So how can I take a screenshot in this Windows XP machine with no snipping tool? We can give you a hint. It's on the keyboard. Yes. It's on the keyboard and you have to press two buttons on the keyboard. The snipping tool has spoiled us. I was happy too when Windows 7 came out with, well, Windows Vista came out. Control V. Okay, so let's try that. So let me do Control V. Okay. And let me see if there is Word on this. Am I doing wishful thinking here? Search. Actually. I don't think Word's on it. Uh, Libri's not on there, is it? Yeah, Open Office is on here. Yeah. Okay, so let me see if that works. Control V. Is that correct? Would Control V do that? What does Control V do, guys? Control V does what? So Control V, uh, I would have to guess that doesn't really work. What's a Control V? No, so Control V stands for paste. If I Control C, I can copy. If I Control V, I can paste. What's the opposite? To take a screenshot. What if I don't have a snipping tool? It literally says it on your computer. All right. So what yeah, you would so actually... control control C will copy, control V will copy. So if you're using what we're talking about on the keyboard, you would control V after you take that screenshot to paste it. Exactly. But control V isn't gonna be the one that actually takes that picture of what we what we would need for the assignment. Exactly. So control C copies, control V paste. Okay. So make sure you remember that. So control V is a shortcut for pasting. Control C is a shortcut for copying, all right? So I'll give it to you. So you would press control print screen. Print screen usually is right on your insert key on um, your keyboard or underneath or above your insert key, okay? So control print screen allows for you to copy, okay? And control V, if you do the print screen correctly, would allow for you to paste uh, that screenshot that you just took. So given that we don't have Word here, I can't really do that. So what I have to do, okay, is open up a Word document. <laughs> Word. Okay, just to show you guys. The snipping tool is a cool tool. You could use it in your assignment, but I just don't want you guys to get into the bad habit of using it. Um, I actually can't use it inside of this. Outside of this, I mean, I'm sure I'm, it's interesting as to why that's not working. Is this not similar to Word? New text document. Sometimes you gotta manually paste it, Doug. Sometimes it doesn't take it. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to do that. Insert. And then if not too, you can always use the VM itself to take a screenshot of the whole. Um... Yeah, that's, that's probably what I'm going to do. Yeah, just you can just do it that way. Yeah. So if it's, it's not if it's not pacing for some reason. Okay, no, that's not the right. All right. So where am I here? Okay. Minimize. Okay, so it doesn't want to do it. So I'm going to go to my VM directly. So I'm going to do the view. Where's the screen? Take a screenshot. So I can just go to view in my VM, click on take a screenshot. Okay. And my VM just took a screenshot for me. Okay. And then it's going to ask me where would I like to paste it? So I can just paste that screenshot onto my desktop and it will save it to the desktop for me. But for the sake of time, we'll just use the snippet tool. But control print screen is what you would use to take a screenshot of the VM. So I'll use my snipping tool for now, and then I'm gonna highlight this entire command line, okay? But what I'm asking you to do, so some people did this to me in the past, they just submitted this. If you submit this for the IP address, do you think you'll get full credit? Yes or no? What do you guys think? Do you think you should get full credit if you just take a screenshot like this and submit it to me or to Professor J? Will this be acceptable if I'm asking you for the IP address?
What do you guys think? All right. So I guess people. You can just type it in the chat, guys, if you've got an idea. Yeah. Type it in the chat. So no. Someone says no. All right. Perfect. Yes, it's not acceptable because there's a lot of stuff here. I don't really know what you're trying to tell me. So what I need you to do when you submit this, you actually have to highlight. Okay. So I'm going to just do a Picasso thing here. You actually have to highlight exactly. Yeah. Picasso gone bad. You have to highlight exactly what it is that I'm asking you for, right? So you have to circle IP address or similar to what the assignment says, I actually want you to use the tool to show me exactly um, what it is that I am asking you for, okay? So that is how you could highlight and give me um, the IP address for uh, your Windows um, machine, okay? So then what I say is I would like for you to explain to me uh, what an IP address is, okay? So I'll give you the brief uh, quick synopsis of the IP address, okay? So that way you guys can understand um, what it uh, essentially really is, okay? So I can give you the Webster's Dictionary, which is a unique str string of numbers separated by periods that identifies each computer using the internet protocol to communicate over a network. Uh, yeah, that definition sounds cool in theory, but if you go in a room and you say that to people, they're going to look at you like you're crazy, okay? So if it's okay if I just circle the IP address instead of the whole line, yes, that's perfectly fine. Um, but make sure you it says IP address because you could be putting in the MAC address or you could be putting a DHCP server. You could be putting the subnet mask. So you want to make sure you specify uh, the different because the default gateway, I'll know that it's a default gateway. Um, so you want to make sure you highlight that it says because the IP address and the number next to it, but that's perfectly fine. Okay. So the way I like to explain IP address is uh, the following. Okay. So an IP address is, um, it stands for internet protocol. Okay. So IP address is the way the internet communicates and speaks to uh, devices or different types of devices. All right. When I was growing up learning this stuff, uh, we never thought it would be what it is today, okay? Because I had AOL and all this ancient stuff. We actually had CDs and I, modems, and I think we had a fat computer in the house. When one person was online, no one else could use it, all right? So let me give you an example of uh, why it's important that you understand what an IP address is, all right? So let's say, for example, um, so yes, internet protocol, and the IP address is what is used for devices to find each other and to communicate and establish a session or a network or, um, communication uh, with each other, all right? So for example, if I wanna go online and go to google.com, usually what most of us would do is we would open up our Internet Explorer, all right? And we would just go to google.com, right? So I could see that this says um, google.com. Um, one thing a lot of people don't understand, which you will as cybersecurity um, gurus that are going to come out of URI, is Google is at Google.com doesn't actually really uh, exist. The reason that Google.com exists is because you have what's known as a DNS, okay, which is one of the things the assignment asks you about. So DNS stands for domain name system. And what a DNS essentially does is it takes a name or names that we know or that we can remember, and it takes an IP address and it translates that, okay? So the best way to understand IP address is it's what is used or it's a unique number that's used. It's really not unique anymore because it changes so often. That's used to identify or find uh, particular devices. So if I wanted to find, you know, Google's IP address, okay, I could actually do one of the commands which you're gonna learn about, which is ping. So I could do go ping google.com. And I would see the following IP address, 172.217.11.46. So if I was to open up a new tab and I was to do 172.217.11.217.11, okay. 
Let me make sure. 172, 217, 11, 46. Okay, dot 11, dot 46. Okay, that is essentially Google's IP address. When I hit 10, it would actually bring me over to Google, right? But who in their right mind would ever remember that that is how I can find Google? Not many people would remember that. So the way we actually remember or know how to get from one website to the other is by using the domain name, the DNS, which is google.com, okay? So your IP address is what's used to uniquely identify a particular device, okay? So one of the things that you can practice to kind of get your head wrapped around this is, you know, you go to facebook.com all the time. Oh, what's Facebook's IP address? So if you were to ping facebook.com, you would actually get the IP address for Facebook. So it is the address that you that uniquely identifies that particular website, that particular device, or that particular um, URL or application that you're trying to find or go to. All right, does that make sense to everyone? It's a numeral. It's it's a label that is assigned, but the label changes so often that I don't want to get too carried uh, away in it. All right, so. I don't want to go too deep into this assignment because I kind of don't really just want to do it for you. I basically just did one through four uh, with you, right? Because the DNS, all right, so if you look here and you want to find the DNS, you would actually see the DNS server for this computer is right here, right? It says it DNS. Um, let's see if I can highlight it. The DNS is 10.0.2. Dot two, right? So those are the things that we're asking you to find. And as you find them, we want you to define and provide an explanation to us about them, right? So I just told you a DNS stands for domain name system. So it is um, an application that exists within your computer that translates your machine to a domain name, a recognizable name, right? Google.com, Facebook.com, URI.com edu etc so uh, that's what that kind of does all right so let's translate over to my linux operating system so we can kind of repeat the same exact steps in linux is this making sense to everyone does anyone have any questions for me does this make sense yes no if you have questions guys just ask please because I'm sure your other colleagues or classmates will have the same questions. So we want to make sure we uh, answer. Okay, perfect. So now I'm actually going to open up the terminal in my Linux. So there's a big difference. And I think this is where the confusion comes in. And this is where I think this class is very beneficial because we introduced you to both platforms. You have your Windows operating system, which, is, which uses a command line, right? A command line is similar to the terminal except for, in my opinion, I think the terminal is a little bit more dangerous because it really does truly give you uh, full access to the machine. The command line does also, but you know, there, you, you don't have a sudo or a um, su command that you can run to basically become super user in um, the command line, All right, unless you elevate yourself to an administrator, which is a little bit more difficult in the Windows operating system. So in order to turn on my terminal, which is similar to my command line in my Linux, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on start and then I'm going to type in terminal and it's going to automatically um, open it up for me. Or I can just use the shortcut, which is control alt T, which also opens up my terminal in my Linux operating system. OK, so the shortcut, let me see if that actually works. Control alt T. OK, there you go. That also opens up my terminal. All right. So you could just search for it or you can press control alt T which also opens up um, the terminal. So in your Linux operating system, what we're asking you to do, and it doesn't matter what flavor or version of Linux you have, it all works the same. The interface may look a little different, but it does the same exact thing, okay? So now that I'm here in my Linux operating system, I also need to find the IP address, okay? However, finding the IP address in my Linux is very different from finding the IP address in my, um, Windows. So if I want to find the IP address in my Linux, what command would I write? Who can tell me? What command would I write, guys? I have, it, I have config, which is correct. That is correct. Very well done. So I would write I have config, okay? 
And once I write IF config, you notice that I get a whole lot more than I actually did in my Windows um, operating system. Okay. So IF config gives me everything that I need to, be, to, to do a lot of cool things. All right. So what is my IP address in this section here? Who can tell me where my IP address is and what is it? And how do you know it's my IP address? Which one of these is my IP address? To, to, to netmask. Uh, where are we? Netmask. No, no, no. Inet. That's correct. So, <laughs> so I don't want to. Uh, yes, it's Inet. So netmask is different. Netmask is what's utilized to determine what class the IP address is a part of, right? Um, but don't worry about that right now. I don't want to cause confusion. Okay. So my Inet right here is actually what my IP address is. Okay. It's right here. INET. Okay. So INET is 10.0.0.215. This is actually what my IP address is. Um, my net mask can lead me to my IP address, but my net mask is used to determine what class my IP address um, falls under. So let me throw a little curveball in here because all we asked you to do was to find um, the IP address, okay, for your um, Linux operating system. Then we say um, the command ifconfig a. So let's write that and see what that does. So ifconfig a. When I run that, what do I get? What's the difference between ifconfig and ifconfig a? What's the difference? What do you guys think the specified value for dash A is? Also, that dash A can be used in IP config as well. In the first question where we ask you what the host name is, if you were to do IP config dash A, it would actually just give you the direct host name with the correlating router that's connected to the machine. Yeah. So you want to explain uh, the dash A to them, uh, Jay? Yeah, the way I always look at dash A is an, it's an attribute function. So it's looking, it's looking for specified attribute files within the parameters of the host machine. So anything that's inside that command would be an attribute function. Exactly. So whenever you start playing in uh, your Linux and your Windows, there's always attribute functions. And what we basically mean by that is let's say you know what the most popular commands are. So there are common commands that we want you to know. You need to know these commands as you move on in the field of IT. Like these commands, are, you're going to be running these commands to the point where you're going to master them. If you feel like you will never learn them, trust me, you will. When I first started doing this, I was like, there's no way I'm going to remember, you know, a hundred commands. But when you run them so much, you just become accustomed to it. Um, so once you know what the most popular 15 or 10 commands are, they always have attributes that go along with them. And the attributes are essentially what gives you access to the uh, inner ax, um, section of the command. So ipconfig slash all would give me everything that ipconfig has to offer, right? Host name, uh, DNS, subnet mask, uh, et cetera. But if I was to write ipconfig dash A, it would give me specifically that attribute related to it okay it's so more concise because you don't always want all that information at once like you would with a dash all it's just too much exactly so when you specify things like dash a it gives you a much more reasonable amount of information stuff that you might actually be looking for yeah so linux server dns server so if i want to find my dns server in my linux operating system what could i do to find the DNS server in my Linux operating system. What would allow me to find the DNS server? How do I find this? This is a good one. Because it's not the same as my Windows. I just showed you the Windows. It's very different. So how do I find my DNS server here in um, my Linux operating system? Can anyone tell me? I, can't, I actually can't just write something simple to get access to it.
All right. I'm glad you're looking at the assignment. Very well done. All right. So yes, so to find my DNS, it's a little bit hidden. So I actually have to go through specific directories, which gives me access to um, that file that actually houses um, that particular server. So I would write cat. Let's see if this works. Slash etc. Slash r e s o l v. Dot conf. Okay. So that is the file that actually houses and holds uh, my DNS server. Okay. So when I write that, I will see that my DNS is essentially itself. Right. It's one twenty seven. Uh, dot zero dot zero dot two fifty three. So if I actually go back up here. Oops, sorry, clicking on the wrong thing. If I actually go back up here where I wrote um, ifconfig, you'll actually notice that I also have uh, my DNS, which is also showing. Let me see if I have it here. Mm -mm -mm. It does, but it's, yeah, I won't get into that too much. Yep, so yeah, so this is the file that actually houses um, and holds uh, my DNS server. So by typing it, I am able to determine and find exactly uh, where um, that DNS is. Okay. And guys, take notice of what that name is, right? It's going to resolve.config. And what was he saying before about what DNS does, right? It resolves IPs to names. So instead of typing in the actual IP address for Google, it actually gives us Google as a surname to type in. Yeah, exactly. So I'll do one more. And then I'm going to stop because I, I want you guys to kind of try to do this on your own. I'll show you a little trick that I don't know if uh, you guys uh, remember, but I can actually clear all this just by hitting clear. And let's say I ran a bunch of commands and it's exam time and I'm like, oh my God, I know I ran all these commands. How do I get back to them? So the shortcut to actually getting back to all this is just writing history. Okay. So by writing history, all the previous commands well, I've written a lot of commands. That's why you see all of this. Don't don't forget freak though. Okay, all of the commands that you um run on your machine will show. So in my machine, and since I last turned it on, I've run over seventy commands. So that's why you see um all of these commands here um that I've run. Right. So let's say you don't remember what command you run and what it did. You can actually just write history, and it will show you a history or a list of all the commands um that you ran. And if you ran a command and you don't really remember what you type or how to write it, by pressing the up arrow, you can go back to the last command that you ran and basically run every single one of those commands back. All right. So the up arrow and history is a good way to kind of get back to some of your um, commands. All right. And if you want to clear your screen, you literally just write clear. Okay. And then if you want to exit the terminal, you type in exit and then the terminal just shuts itself up. And All you right. can also do control C to clear it as well. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So let me show you this last thing. Um, CLS is how you clear your screen on the Windows machine. Um, what's do you know the shortcut J for clearing your machine on the Windows? Is it control It should be con it should be control C. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yep. So control C is it the shortcut also that you could run uh, to clear your screen on um, your Windows machine as well. Okay. So the last thing that the assignment's asking you to get is to provide the physical MAC address, et cetera. I'm not going to go into that too much. I'm going to let you guys do that piece and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay. So that's basically, uh, let me share this screen here. That is basically, all right, your, networking uh, lesson and assignment uh, overview, okay? So that's the networking part one assignment overview. And that's really what we want you to do this week. Uh, I want you to have fun and play with, you know, Linux and um, the Windows operating system and really kind of get yourself accustomed to uh, what it is that's um, happening uh, within both of these uh, operating systems so you can have fun with it, all right? So for number nine on the assignment, the line with HW address isn't showing up for me. I'm not sure why. Hold on, let me take a look. Let me see. 
Hold on, let me try to pull this back up here. I actually turned it off. Give me one second, okay? Are you writing it in there correctly? Usually, sometimes you make a little typo, and that can cause that issue to happen. Networking. Question nine, HW address. Oh, I see what you're doing. No, no, no. All right, so, so, <clears throat> no. So what this question nine is saying, it's saying, what is the MAC address for your Linux machine? Um, it's saying the VM's MAC address is called HW address. So you're not actually typing in HW address. It's saying to you that's what it's going to be called, all right? So your MAC address will actually be something that you will um, see, but it's called HW address. So let me give you an example. Let me just do this on my uh, Windows 10, okay? So here is, hold on a second. Okay, so here is my uh, machine that I'm running at home, okay? Um, I could just do IF config. I hate running this command. It gives me a bunch of things that I don't need. Oh, <laughs> IF config. IP config slash all, I'm sorry. Okay, so when I write IP config slash all, I'm gonna scroll all the way to the top. Media disconnected. Where's the MAC address? Physical address, okay? So in my system here, it's called physical address. Let me actually clear this. Okay, CLS. Um, so I'm gonna write get MAC, okay? So to get my MAC address here, um, I don't like this. So on my system for my Windows machine, it's actually called a physical address, which gives me a a hexadecimal address, right? So in your system, instead of saying uh, MAC address, it's gonna say HW address. And in the Windows, it's actually gonna say physical address. So that's essentially um, what it's saying here um, that you're gonna see and get. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and we can, uh, and you can come to office hours for that. And we'll, I'll do another lecture where I troubleshoot and go over some of the common VM issues that some people are having. As yeah, well. guys, I have I have office hours on Thursdays, one to two in Tyler, uh, fifty two. Um, and obviously, if you need anything prior to that or after that, you can't make the hours. Just send me an email, and uh, feel free to come by my office. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Sorry. No, that's all I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure you guys utilize Professor Jay. He makes himself very available. So definitely go there and go see him. He's knowledgeable in a lot of this and he can uh, definitely get you guys up and running and uh, started. So definitely go see him. But from now until the end of the semester, you need your Windows XP and your Linux running. We're going to be doing some very, very heavy duty stuff inside of both operating systems. So we at this point, we should have it all up and running because you want to make sure that um, you're running a lot of the commands that we're going to be running. All right. So let me do this real quick. Um, and then we should uh, be out of here um, by 815. Okay. The virtual machines assignment, which was the first assignment that we uh, assigned um, to you guys. Okay. So here's the virtual machines assignment. And what the virtual machines assignment wanted you to do was it wanted you to install and set up um, virtual box. Okay. So you had to set up and install VirtualBox. You have to download the Windows XP, which um, I just showed you. I was working inside of uh, Windows XP. So once you set up um, Windows XP, okay, this is essentially um, what it should look like for you uh, in your virtual machine, right? You should have two 
uh, virtual machines um, up and running, all right? So once you install it, it should look like the following. Give me one second. Okay, should look like the following. You should have, okay, Windows XP. So if I double click on my Windows XP, okay, this is what it should look like once I uh, set it up. Okay, you definitely wanna make sure you have this. If you don't have this up and running like this, please go see uh, Professor J and he will help you uh, get it up and running, okay? Um, the next thing you need to have up and running is uh, your Linux, okay? Your Linux environment should look like um, the following. Okay, so when I double click, on my Linux, it should look like this, all right? Then I should be able to put my password in and I should be able to log into my Linux environment. So your Linux environment should look exactly uh, like this. Again, there's different flavors of Linux that exist, so it doesn't have to necessarily look like the uh, what I'm showing you. Your Linux can look uh, very, um, very different from what I'm showing you here. So your Linux uh, may, okay, look like the following. So I'm gonna show you another example of what your Linux um, could look like. Let me see here. Where am I? Okay, so I'm gonna share screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. The uh, py Python and Linux one, right? Yeah, okay, I shared the wrong screen. Hold on, share screen. So your Linux may look, you know, like this, okay? It doesn't really matter uh, what it looks like. Uh, it's perfectly fine. Okay, again, control, alt, C. See, I still get a terminal. And I still get all of the things that I'm asking you to, um, for the most part. Okay. So that's exactly um, what it should uh, look like. Okay. So that's basically what we wanted you to do for the virtual uh, machines assignment. Okay. Then basically this is just to attach it and set it up. And we wanted you to answer questions uh, one through 10. I'm not going to, I'll do another lecture where I just post that for you guys. I'm not going to waste your time uh, going into that uh, too much. All right. So that's basically all there was to really the virtual machines assignment. You just had to come in here, set this operating system up, take a few screenshot and uh, provide it to us, okay? So, um, and install it. And that's really it for that particular uh, part of it. Yeah, I'll have to come in every time I boot up when it got more. Time. Yeah, uh, he was saying, Doug, before, uh, he's only running four megs for RAM, which is the first issue, but I think he might have downloaded the 64-bit uh, desktop version, in which case it causes the uh, the graphics to just skew like that when it boots up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So so just to, a, a quick solution to that is you re just restart your Linux after you set it up. Um, but I would delete that Linux and definitely uh, yeah. do the alternate version so you don't run into that. But if you reset your Linux, it should fix that. Um, and the reason it does that is because it's reading it as a desktop. The graphics card is not being read properly. So I would definitely um, um, stay away from that uh, piece. Yeah, and if you have any issues, just come by my office this week. Just shoot me an email. Let me know uh, what time works for you because I'm, I'm usually in from 8 to 5, uh, Monday through Friday. So. Yeah. Just let me know if it's, but make sure you download the um, ISO for the 64 bit alternate and then uh, delete the old partition and go through the same steps you did before, browse the ISO and install it. Exactly. And make sure, you, make sure you give it the default 512 megs because yeah. four, four is not going to work. Yeah. And yeah. in 1982, it would have worked, but not, not now. It, it you know, <laughs> requires way too much RAM. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't even want to get into the diskit errors. All right. That was a, uh... It's very stressful. Um, I used to image machines with floppy disk. All right. Um, so yeah, that's basically the virtual machines assignment. You have to just set up your virtual machine. And what I'll do is I'll do a personalized configuration and setup, and I'll post that lecture 
um, so you guys can see it. But the best way is to see someone physically. So go see Professor J and he'll definitely help you with that, okay? The last thing we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna do the introduction to Python and Linux operating system uh, assignment, okay? So here we are, introduction to Python and Linux operating system assignment. And I think this assignment caused a little bit of confusion to people. So what I wanna do is kind of explain it and let you guys know some of the updates that I'm gonna make because your feedback is very valuable and it really helps me um, you know, know and learn what I need to kind of improve uh, okay, just trying not to kill. Oh, <laughs> you won't kill your mic, uh, your Mac. I mean, Mac is, uh, it, I wouldn't say it's bulletproof. When it first came out, everyone thought it was. That's because hackers didn't really care much on um, destroying Macs. But uh, you won't. Your Mac, usually, what year is the Mac? Is it 10, 15, 17? I'm pretty sure your Mac has at least four or eight gigs of RAM. Yeah, that Mac is more than good enough. I would at, assign at least one or two gigs. Uh, I would do one gig to that. I would assign one gigabyte of RAM to the- L Linux the doesn't require much at all. It so doesn't. Especially Lubuntu. I mean, you can get away with 512 easily and it will still run very well. Yeah, Linux is a lightweight OS. It's like the best thing ever created. Yeah, like, but Lubuntu is the mo one of the most lightweight um, OS's that you can use. So 512 is all you need. It won't, it won't mess up your Mac though, I promise you. Yeah, it won't. Um, what I do recommend that you do put one gig on is the Windows XP because it does get yeah. sluggish when you're trying to do. The recommended amount is two gigs. We try to push it with one. Um, it says one, but rule of thumb for Windows, whatever they say, double it because that's kind of how they build their system. It's very heavy and resource heavy. When we say heavy, what we mean is it uses a lot of resources on your machine. The, the, the Linux doesn't use a lot of resources, the Windows does, but your Mac is more than uh, powerful enough, okay? So let's take a look at the introduction to the Python and Linux assignment. So I think this assignment caused some confusion uh, to some people and part of it was uh, some clarification that I think that um, I should have done uh, on my end, okay? So I asked you to install Python is an optional assignment. The Linux operating system that you downloaded in the previous assignment, Lubuntu, comes with Python and can be used to complete this assignment. So you actually did not even need um, to download or set up Linux. Um, I mean, Linux, I'm sorry, Python. But if you wanted to, you could have downloaded Python uh, to get this assignment up and running, okay? So for this assignment, you will download Python for your Windows operating system. So if you are using a Windows operating system, what I asked that you did, in case you didn't wanna use the Linux because it wasn't working or whatever the case may be, was that you went to python.org, okay? Simply by clicking on this link here, which would bring you right here to python.org, okay? You could click on download and it would give you the latest Python or the older version of Python um, that was available. Um, one of the things that I did is I built the assignment using Python 2.17, okay, instead of Python 3. And I think some of you downloaded the latest version, which was Python uh, 3. So I have to make a few updates, but, you know, for the most part, it still worked. There were some syntax changes that occurred because whenever there's an update, they try to make, uh, they try to improve the code so the system can read it better. It's more lightweight, less resource heavy. And it actually flows a little bit better. Um, and the reason we introduce you to Python is because it is the most widely adopted and easiest language to learn. All of the stuff you're seeing about artificial intelligence and all of those cool things that are out right now, they're all built in Python, okay? They're built in Python or C++ um, or Java. They're moving away. Well, I'm moving away from the Java because I'm not a fan of it, but you know, Python and C++ are definitely um, some of the things that they utilize a lot, okay? Um, and I think I said, see, I said 3.6, and look, it's at 3.6.4. Literally, this thing updates every two, three months, so me keeping up with it is uh, difficult, okay? But I'm I have to install it all the time in the labs, and I'm all <laughs> constantly <laughs> updating the machines with that. With the Python? <laughs> yeah, every, every month there's a new, a new version that needs to get pushed out. Yeah, and what I'm going to I'm going to come down over the summer and work with you on the Python. So, we'll be uh we'll be gurus in this. Um and there's ways to make it push itself, but you don't want to do that, okay? So, once you've downloaded Python, I wanted you to provide a screenshot of running uh Python in your workstation, okay? So, to do that in my Windows, 
I would simply, again, go to my terminal, okay? And I would literally write Python, okay? Dash, dash, version, okay? And then from here, you would see, see, even my machines thing, you would see that I'm running Python 3.52, right? And that is me showing you how I was able to run Python on my Windows machine. What I said is you did not have to download this because you could have also had this on your Linux operating system. So what does that look like if you were running um, Linux, okay? So let me show you exactly what I mean here. So if you are running Linux, okay? If you are running Linux instead, <clears throat> I'm gonna log in, okay? Can everyone see my Linux, by the way? Yes. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. I'm going to post the um, the lecture, so uh, you'll be fine. Uh, go eat. You make sure you spend uh, all the money you're paying for, for, for that food. I remember those days. I won't even get into it. All right. So to get um, the version that I'm running for Python here. It's the same exact thing that I just did on my Windows. I would just type in Python, okay, dash, dash version, okay. So by typing that, you will see that I am able to see the different versions um, that I'm running on uh, both um, operating systems, right? So I could actually do this Python assignment right here from my Linux operating system, which is why um, I wanted you to get the Linux up and running so that way you can kind of do the additional assignments that we're asking you to do, okay? From here, okay, I asked you to provide a screenshot. So you would take a screenshot of this, highlight it and explain to me exactly um, what you did, okay? So the first question you had to answer is, uh, what is Python and what is um, Python uh, used for, okay? So what is um, Python? So how can I explain this, okay? Um, so Python is an object-oriented uh, high-level language, okay? Uh, it's uh, simple and easy to use and learn um, the syntax, okay? And Python is what is considered a general purpose um, language. So a lot of what it's used for um, is testing microchips. It's used for data science now. Um, it's used to really build video games, build libraries, build databases, and a lot of cool things that we take for granted are actually built behind the scenes. If you uncover the layers, um, Python plays a uh, heavy role um, in it, okay? So that's kind of what I wanted you um, to do. It's an object-oriented language, right? Some examples of those object-oriented languages are um, C++, uh, Java, um, let me think, uh, it's all over, okay? Um, basically, it, you can kind of use it to do a lot of cool and uh, nifty um, things with it, so to speak, okay? So, <clears throat> once you explained what Python was, um, what I wanted you to do in the assignment was to start Python, okay? In order to start Python in your Linux or your Windows operating system, what you basically had to write literally was Python, okay? Once you write that, you will get the little two, uh, three lines that you see. I am now actually running Python, okay? So now I actually have Python in my machine and um, I'm, I'm running it, okay? So the first thing that I asked you to do was to write print, okay? Um, hello world, all right? So by writing print hello world, you will notice that hello world gets um, displayed back to me. So what print essentially does is it displays whatever it is that I'm asking for it to display. So I wrote hello world, which is a string, and I said to Python to print that string um, to me, okay? So Python, Python in return, prints um, hello world uh, back to me, okay? So what is a um, string, okay? 
A string uh, can be anything uh, that you want it to be. Uh, usually it's a character, contains a, it's a, it contains a text or different types of characters. Could a string be numbers, uh, data, et cetera? Yes, it can. However, the difference being is um, strings are only read by any programming language that you create as um, text, okay? Which means you can't really do much with it. You can display it. You can show it, you can concatenate it, meaning you can combine them together, but strings can't really uh, do much, okay? You, basically, it's the first basic things uh, you learn when programming, but you, know, you can use strings to create some uh, very, very um, powerful um, things, okay? Um, and one of the things that makes uh, Python very different in addition to being an object-oriented language is it reads everything as an object, so you can actually take strings and rearrange them, which we'll get deeper into as we get into it, okay? So the second part, well, the, so we're still on the first part of the assignment. The next thing that I asked you to do was to use your Python to write um, the following. So I said to create a basic um, variable. So I said x equals 28, okay? On line one, and then I asked you to press enter, okay? And then I said x plus 15. So what I'm basically showing you is the power behind Python and some of the cool things that you can do, such as uh, mathematical calculation, um, creating strings, et cetera. So what I just did is I created a variable and my variable equals 28. So X is a variable. Variable can be anything uh, you want it to be. So a variable is known as a container, right? An empty container. Think about what happens when you have an empty container. You can put anything you want in that empty container and whatever's inside or whatever you put in that empty container is what that container becomes. So X really represents nothing, right? X could be whatever I want it to be. Instead of X, I could write name equals 28 and name would be um, that variable. So name would be what I would put in that container, right? So your container can have anything you want it to have in it. So X is my variable, which is equal to 28. So I'm saying X, since X is 28, I've identified X as 28. I'm saying, okay, now I want you to take X and add 15 to it. <clears throat> when I hit enter, you will notice that I get 53. Why? Because it just took my variable 28, which is represented by X, it added 15 to it. So now it's showing me that 28 plus 15 is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 43, right? So those are some of the things that I wanted you to practice um, in that assignment. And that was basically part one of um, the assignment. The second part of the assignment, um, I wanted you to perform a more complex uh, mathematical calculation just so you could see um, the power behind Python. I wanted you to provide a screenshot of it. So I said to do 200 plus <coughs> 300 uh, divide, I mean, sorry, times 400 divided by 25, okay? Uh, some people could do that in their head. Um, I happen to be one of those nerds that could. Uh, it's not really a cool skill set. It's kind of useless unless you're gonna go in Jeopardy or something. Um, but if you don't know how to do it in your head, it doesn't really matter because Python could do it um, for you, right? So this is a cool way to show you how Python can kind of solve a lot of answers for you. And one of the things you're gonna have to do in computer science, because most of you are majoring in it, you're going to have to take some pretty cool math classes. And believe it or not, um, let's say you're trying to find uh, derivatives and uh, x-intercept, et cetera. Python can actually solve all of that for you just by writing the command, and it will give you the answers um, for some of those mathematical um, calculations. I think there's a math calculator that's actually built using only Python. And you can write any equation in it, and it gives you the answer. Right but I won't reveal uh, much more than that. And then um, I asked you to basically create um, variables for the following. I said to create a variable for total marks, first name, last name, team one, team two, team three. So I gave you a reading that I asked you to read and I basically told you to create these variables based on the character data sets that the reading um, talked about, right? There are different types of character data sets um, that the reading uh, introduced you to, which I won't go too deep into, um, but I'll give you a brief example of um, what I wanted you to do. I'm so, sorry, I can't help out with that one. Sorry, guys, I have a 
some AI stuff that I'm building in my house and it gets annoying at times. Let me turn it off. Hold on one second. All right, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the first thing I asked you to do <coughs> was to create first name. So all you would have to do is do first name, okay, equals Douglas, okay. Then I would do last name equals, so we're using camel case here. And if you get into programming, you'll learn about all of that, but the reason you do that is so the system and the database can read the difference, okay? Then I asked you to create team. So I would have done team one equals blue, okay? And then team two equals red, team three equals green, okay? Um, and one of the things you definitely want to do, which I didn't do here, is you want to close these ups with um, with uh, semicolons. Okay, let me actually make sure. Yeah, you definitely want to close them with uh, semicolons in um, the new pythons, okay, because I'm sorry, with colons in the new Python because that can definitely um, cause for your Python to not um, be read um, properly. So you definitely want to make sure that as you create uh, variables inside of Python um, that you close them uh, properly, all right? So it, the way I wrote it, it will work, um, but you definitely want to um, close all of your colons um, properly, okay? so. What I, I mean, all of your variables properly. All right, so this is acceptable for now because we're just doing simple variables. But if you get deeper into it, you want to make sure that you're closing um, variables and you're just leaving them open because that can cause issues when it comes to reading um, your code, okay? So right now, I have first name, which is equivalent uh, to Douglas, okay? And then I have uh, last name, okay? Team one, team two, team three, okay? Then I said, once you have created these variables above, please provide a screenshot of those variables. So I wanted you to essentially provide a screenshot of um, the variables. So how can I test if my variables work properly? All I would have to do is basically print. Okay, so let me just try to print some of these variables so you guys can see exactly um, what I just did here, okay? So if I was to do print, let's do team one, okay? should show me blue. So if I was to do print seam two, it should show me red. And if I was to do print seam three, okay, it should show me green, okay? So you notice that the variables I created are displaying properly inside of my um, terminal, okay? So I'm basically seeing some of the things that I created here and um, they're working uh, properly, okay? So make sure you do that reading to learn about character data sets. Um, you need to have a good understanding of programming um, in this field. You don't need to be a programmer. You know, by no means am I an expert programmer, but you want to understand uh, what the language does and the power that sits behind it. So when you see it, you can identify, oh, this is Python, or this is uh, Java, or this is this, so you can unfold it, okay? So from here, um, I wanted you to then um, use what's known as concatenation, okay, and explain what a string is, right? So I just told you a string is a character data set that us that's usually a character, not a character data set, I'm sorry, it's a character that's usually uh, represented by a text of some um, sort, okay? So then the last thing I wanted you to do was to concatenate two of your strings. So everything we've created here is a string. Why is it a string? Because I put it in quotes. Whenever you put anything in quotes, in uh, Python, it's essentially read as a string, okay? Even if you were to put um, numbers, which you can actually perform mathematical calculations with, once you put them in quotes, it's read as a string, okay? So let me give you an example of what I mean. So if I was to write um, uh, tests, okay, equals um, quotes one, 
Okay, and then I was to write um, results, okay, equals one. There's a big difference between those two. The first one is a string, the second one is not. Okay, the first one is read as a string, which means that Python only reads test as text, even though it has a number in it. Results equals one is read as a number data type, meaning I can perform mathematical calculations with it to get results. So if I was to write, just so you guys can see, test, okay, plus five and hit enter, okay, I would get what? Okay, syntax, hold on, did I do that right? Let me see here, print. Okay. I will get syntax error, et cetera, et cetera, okay? However, if I was to write results plus five, okay, I would get six, okay? You see the difference. So the syntax error is basically saying you cannot, it even says it, type error cannot concatenate strings in INC objects. So I cannot concatenate integers and I cannot concatenate strings, however, given that results wasn't in one, once I did results plus five, I am able to concatenate them. However, <clears throat> I mean, not concatenate, um, uh, perform mathematical calculation in them. However, I can concatenate strings, meaning I can combine them together. So what I wanted you to do was to concatenate um, two of your uh, uh, variables um, that you created, your teams, okay? So if I was to concatenate or combine my two teams or my first name or whatever, I would just do first name plus last name, okay? And when I hit enter, I would get Douglas Tantra. Why? Because my first name and my last name both are strings. So it concatenates them, it combines them together, okay? There's a big difference, the plus operator is used for two things. One, it's used for mathematical calculation, okay? Two, it can also be used to combine two like things together, such as strings. But if I have numbers, it will combine them, it will perform mathematical calculation. And that's basically what I wanted you to do for um, that particular uh, assignment. I wanted you to um, do that to kind of really show me um, that, you know, after you did um, the reading, you know, you had a very uh, good understanding of kind of, you know, what I was um, asking you uh, to do um, for uh, the most part uh, to really develop a, a good understanding um, of it. And then once you did that, that was basically it uh, for those two um, assignments uh, to hand in to me. So you can kind of say, okay, I understand the basics of Python and I understand how powerful Linux is because Linux actually is built on um, Python and Python is a part of Linux where I can run and build um, certain things. And the reason I introduced this this early to you is because as we move forward in more complicated assignments, you actually are gonna be using Linux and Python a whole lot more um, to build things in this class, okay? So that's all I have for tonight. Um, as far as the agenda goes, if you guys have any questions, uh, I will do my best to answer them now. If you can't think of any questions, feel free to email us or post to the forum. Um, and, uh, but I'll take questions now as well. Questions? And if you guys see, like you said, if you think of anything later, just post on the forums. I usually check up until like 12 or one in the morning in case you guys have any last minute questions or uh, send us, send either of us an email. All right. Uh, low level. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, I what do you mean by low level? Help me understand what you're asking here. You want, you mean the,
Oh, uh, what? Um, well, there's different distributions um, of Linux. So I think the OS family in general, it's Unix-like. So it's Unix-based. And I think Unix is built in uh, C. Uh, it's built in C, ARM. Um, it's, it's evolved over time, so to speak. So I'm actually trying to look online right now. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty Unix. Unix is yeah, it's primarily C and assembly. So if you yeah, C and assembly because in order to make it lightweight, it has to be a lightweight language, and assembly is a very lightweight um language, and C and C plus plus is a lightweight language. Um, believe it or not, when Facebook first came out, they actually built the whole application uh with PHP, and then um. I guess nerds like myself used to uh, say, oh, let's explore, expose the vulnerabilities in uh, Facebook, which we used to do all the time because it was such a poorly built application, I mean, a website, um, that they fixed it. Uh, they transferred it over to uh, Java. And then they realized there were some issues with that. So now they actually have a sandbox environment that can take Java and basically funnel it through and rebuild it in C++ in C. So now Facebook is uh, it has pretty good security now, believe it or not. So the vulnerabilities are gone, but it's now built in uh, C++. But C, assembly, and C++ are usually most of the powerful languages now that most sophisticated applications are built in. Because you want the application to be lightweight, especially with the evolution of mobile devices and everyone wanting to be able to carry their things with them wherever they go. Does that answer your question? But it's C and assembly. All right. Any other questions? So yeah, if you want to master a language, definitely learn Java and C++ because yeah, they go hand in hand. And you'll definitely never be. Uh, yeah, well, let's just say Google reaches out to me all the time to ask for engineers who know those languages every single time. All right. So if you guys, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I thought someone had a question. All right. If you guys have no other questions, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, I hope you guys uh, had a great spring break and are looking forward to, uh, you know, getting started um, for the rest of the semester. All right. Good luck, guys. And again, please feel free to reach out to me and Professor Jay. We're here to help you. And our goal is to make this class as fun and as interesting as possible. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.